Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, welcome to the public lecture organized by uh, Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies Public Policy in Islam program, Hamad bin Khalifa University, in collaboration with Museum of Islamic Art. And as the director of the Public Policy in Islam program, uh, on behalf of our faculty, I would like to welcome all of you here uh, joining us tonight uh, for this wonderful and very exciting uh, public lecture by Professor Robert Hillenbrand. And uh, very shortly, I would like to introduce you, Professor Hillenbrand, although his work is globally well known, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with his work. Um, Professor Hillenbrand had his formation in the University of Cambridge and uh, University of Oxford, uh, Oxford University, sorry. Uh, he had visiting professorships in, across the world. If I start counting them right now, I would be the speaker for today, so I will not. Uh, he published 12, uh, uh, 21 books, 10 of them are under his authorship, and seven of them are edited and four co-edited. His research interests are mostly Islamic architecture, iconography, and Islamic art and painting, and especially with special focus on uh, Iran and early Syria. Uh, he, he has also published more than 160 journal articles, and he's currently uh, the principal curator of the Royal Academy exhibition entitled Syria, current on hold, and he's also uh, Emeritus Professor of Islamic Art History, University of Edinburgh, and also Professor of uh, Art History in University of St. Andrews. So, um, please enjoy, and approximately the lecture will be 40 minutes, 45 minutes? Um, 50. 50, 50 minutes approximately. Afterwards, there's going to be a Q&A &A session. And when we are finished, there's actually a um, a section for refreshment beverages in the in the right hand. Uh, it's at the end of the corridor. Uh, please enjoy. And uh, thanks to Professor Hillenbrand for c coming us and for making this presentation possible. Thank you. Is this working? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sometime in the year 391 Hijri. which corresponds in the Christian calendar to 1000 to 1001, the celebrated calligrapher Ibn al-Bawab wrote the colophon for a Quran whose copying he had just completed in the city of peace, Madinah to Salam, Baghdad. Did he, I wonder, realize that he was making history? For specialists in Islamic calligraphy, the name Ibn al-Bawab is one to conjure with, for tradition ascribes to him the crucial achievement in refining the so-called proportioned script, al-Khat al-Mansub, of his celebrated predecessor, Ibn Mukla. I don't propose in this paper to examine the precise ways in which Ibn al-Bawab might have executed these unnamed improvements. Such a discussion is speculative from start to finish because no specimen of Ibn Mukla's uh, calligraphy, which everybody accepts as genuine, has survived. Yet that hasn't discouraged detailed and fragrantly unhistorical attempts to analyze Ibn Mukla's innovations, and here's one of them. Welcome logic, farewell fantasy. But the Quran of Ibn al-Bawab is not important just because it is the unique survival of a great calligrapher's handiwork, even though that has traditionally been the reason why people single it out for comment. No, this little book, about that size, has a much greater significance because in it there converge so many innovations that it's nothing less than a hinge of Islamic culture. This volume marks a great divide. Afterwards, there was no looking back. It heralds new approaches to the Quran 
uh, new forms of piety, new evidence for the self-renewing capacity of Islamic calligraphy. It's a crucial step in the direction of popular culture, and it embodies technological developments whose horizon is unbounded. Finally, it has a great deal to say about the aesthetic principles which underpinned fine writing at this time. Now, these are large claims, and they require supporting evidence. Let me make clear at the outset that I'm not trying to suggest that Ibn al-Bawab himself, and only himself, was directly responsible for the revolutionary changes which I've just outlined. It's entirely possible that there were earlier examples of small Qur'ans written in Nasr on paper. There are, after all, at least three surviving secular manuscripts from this period that have the same format. I'm well aware that his book is a welcome, but nevertheless a chance, a random survival. But it is an astonishingly fortunate survival, for it dates from the very period that these changes began to manifest themselves. If he was not chronologically the first, he was certainly one of the first. His Quran can therefore serve without undue distortion of the truth for, as, as, as a symbol for a complex process of change. For the innovations that converged and intersected in this very manuscript, the first of the new kind to survive as a complete, dated and provenanced and signed piece are all vital. Moreover, for the purpose of the argument that follows, it's not relevant that Ibn al-Bawab was perhaps the most famous calligrapher of his time, much copied, much forged, and that he would therefore have commanded a hefty fee for this little book. That would have made this Quran a luxury item. What matters is that the developments I want to analyze today can reasonably be linked with Baghdad, the premier metropolis of Islam at a time when its cultural and religious prestige was still high. This was not a series of discoveries made in some obscure provincial town. If this manuscript is any guide, they occurred, these changes, at the right place, at the right time, to ensure maximum publicity for the new inventions. Moreover, there seems to have been an explosion of what we could call book culture in Baghdad in the late 10th and 11th centuries, a phenomenon uh, illustrated in various ways by the diary of Ibn al-Banna and the spread of the madrasa as an official institution. Now, I want to structure this lecture around the three incontrovertible elements of this book. Number one, its material. Number two, its script. Number three, its size. I want to deal with each of these in turn, and I'll try to tease out their implications. All of them are obvious, but all of them have been underestimated in the discussion of this important book. First then, the material, its paper. As is well known, paper making entered the Islamic world uh, in the wake of the capture at the Battle of Talas in 751 of Chinese paper makers. Talas is the modern Jambul in eastern Kazakhstan, that is at the very eastern end of the Islamic world. No wonder then that the early stages of the development of this uh, technique, this new technique, are obscure. The names given to the types of paper manufactured at this stage in Baghdad 
all point to Khorasan, uh, to Transoxiana, to the Eastern Islamic world. Indeed, it's been suggested that Samarkand uh, supplied the needs of the entire Islamic world for paper. It's perhaps not surprising that this newfangled, unusual material, paper, should have been rejected for so long for use in Qurans, especially Qurans, that is, the Book of Books. Perhaps it was deemed unworthy at first. Indeed, the earliest Qur'an on paper is an example in so-called Eastern Kufic, dated 972, only a generation earlier than the time of Ibn al-Bawab. And that is more than two centuries after the Muslims first encountered paper. 200 years before you move to a paper Qur'an. It took that long for paper to conquer this last castle of conservatism. <coughs> the style of writing of this first surviving uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of Kufic places it squarely within the Buyid lands of Iraq and Western Iran and thus links it to the world of Ibn al-Bawab. Here are typical examples, so-called a broken cursive or Eastern Kufic. Now, what is implied by the use of paper? The answer can be summed up in a single word. It's cheap. <laughs> and that opens up a whole series of further perspectives. In comparison with animal skin, parchment or vellum, the only serious competing material for Qur'ans, except in Egypt where papyrus was widely used, paper demanded materials that were much cheaper and more easily available than wild gazelles or cows. And by the way, when I say a cow, I actually mean a fetal calf. I mean that a cow was killed while pregnant so that its calf could be used for the skin of the Qur'an because the underbelly of the calf is the best type of vellum. Now you imagine what that means in a world where the difference between wealth and poverty is a cow. But cheapness is relative. The medieval techniques of paper making were complex and time consuming. And as with parchment, there are several grades of quality. Now you look at yourself and your use of paper. We have a thoughtless and massive consumption of paper made from wood pulp in industrial quantities and we put no value on paper at all. And so we mislead ourselves in looking at medieval paper. The situation in the Middle East in medieval times was quite different. Hence the frequent reuse of paper. People bought books and then sliced out the unused leaves uh, for later use. So paper manufactured for writing was not dirt cheap, although its materials, rotten linen, rags, hemp, those are cheap. In fact, few aspects of the medieval book trade could be described as cheap. Nasir al-Khusro, the Iranian, visits uh, Cairo in, in around 1050, and he notices that the merchants in the bazaars are wrapping up their pro their the things they sell in paper. And he comments on that. Quite clearly, in distant Iran, you wouldn't waste paper that way. So Egypt was obviously making very cheap paper, wrapping paper. The only evidence as to the price of paper which has yet been published 
is a reference from a 10th century papyrus document. And therefore, I think it probably refers to the situation in Egypt, stating that 33 sheets of paper cost 1.66. It is deeply frustrating that the currency is not mentioned. And you therefore have to choose between the gold dinar or the silver dirham. Either way, this is significantly cheaper than vellum, but it was still not cheap. As late as 1000, the year that Ibn al-Bawab wrote his sole surviving Quran, a vizier in Egypt, a certain Ja'afar ibn Hinzaba, had all the paper he needed brought from Samarkand. But this very period, around 1000, also saw the breaking of the Samarkand monopoly. And paper began to be made in several other areas, Damascus, Tiberias, Tripoli, Sana'a, and all over Egypt. Hence, perhaps, the decline of papyrus as a writing material. It may also have something to do with the rapid growth in the production of all kinds of Arabic texts from about 800 onwards. So the late 10th century saw paper establish itself as the writing material used by the Abbasid government and the administration. And it was used especially for accounts. If you use vellum for accounts and you are a cheat and a liar and you want to make money and you want to change the figures, all you need is a knife and you scrape out the correct figure and put in the false figure. If you try to do that on paper, you leave your fingerprints on it because the paper disintegrates and leaves a, a blotch, a blob, and your attempt to change the figure is revealed. Paper costs less than vellum for another reason. It could be made more quickly and significant economies of scale were possible with large-scale production. The frames within which the individual sheets of paper uh, were made before they were dried were easily manufactured and could be quickly reused as soon as a sheet of paper was lifted out and put on a board uh, for drying. Vellum, by contrast, needs to be stretched on a frame for days on end. And then it needs to be carefully scraped to remove the hairs so that you can write on it. The very nature of paper means that you can put one leaf upon the other, as you see, and press it so that the book is a smaller book. Now, a book of parchment with this many pages will be three times as thick. So that immediately revolutionizes the status of the book as an artifact. It opens the way for much longer texts to be put into a small format. Here is an example. It's a book on lexicography by a certain Anahwi dated 976. A full sheet of the kind that was usually used for a big Quran could be folded now once, creating four sides instead of two, or it could be folded twice, creating eight sides instead of two. Now the fact that uh, paper, as against parchment, offered dramatic savings in material and labor with a concomitant increase of speed in production and of quantity of output, and of much more text within the covers of a volume, means that the market for books suddenly exploded. Baghdad especially, as Ibn Nadim uh, notes, was a major center for the book trade, with a street named after the booksellers, Sharia al-Warraq, which contained a hundred of their shops. 
All of this meant a wider range of patrons, a wider range of uses. Books stopped being the property of the very rich. And so learning, education itself, was made more democratic. Once the Quran, the core book of Islamic culture, began to be copied on paper, it could be said that paper had well and truly arrived and could be used for all kinds of texts. In sum, then, the impact of paper on Islamic culture culminated in the lifetime of Ibn al-Bawab, who died in 1022. One, in the production of dramatically cheaper copies of the Quran as of other books. Two, in a much enlarged market for books generally. Three, in a democratization of the entire learning process. All that stems from paper as distinct from vellum. This was a sea change of comparable importance to the introduction of printing, the invention of the typewriter, or in our own lifetimes of the paperback book and now the computer and the internet. The invention of paper, the use of paper on a big scale is a Gutenberg moment. It's a Bill Gates moment. It changes the landscape forever. So much for my first theme, paper. I come now to the second significant element of this little Quran, its script. This is the first surviving dated Quran to use Nasr, the standard cursive script for the body of the text. The first complete surviving dated Quran. There are earlier leaves, but not a complete one. It has other scripts as well. And I don't have time to explore what caused this preference for a standardized rounded script. But again, there are many implications. For some 350 years, all Qurans had been written in one form or another of Kufic script. And the result was that by the year 1000, the association between Kufic script and Quran had become automatic. But for all other texts, except the Quran, various forms of nas or cursive script were in use. And they were used as the standard means of commu it was used as the standard means of com communication for letters, for bills, for contracts, for graffiti, as well as for more formal uh, literary purposes. So the key breakthrough is to use a script whose prime associations were secular for a religious purpose, copying the Quran. And Nas is simpler, it's easier to read, it's incomparably more user-friendly than Kufic hands. So why use Nas? Was it to do primarily with the Quran, or did the motivation have more to do with the script? If the prime focus of change was the Quran itself, then the obvious purpose of that change was to make the sacred text more legible than ever before. That, in turn, would make it available not to the few people who could read Kufic, but to anyone who could read, <coughs> and thus it would greatly enlarge the circle of potential readers. It also ensured that the Quran was no longer the preserve of those, perhaps a privileged few and elite, who had learned the difficult, complex, and ambiguous uh, Kufic hands, many of which make reading still harder because of their relative lack of diacritical and vocalizing marks. 
No fata, kasra, dhamma, sukun, tashdeed, tanwin. And so, without that, reading becomes very hard work. <coughs> you can see forms of kufik in the first three uh, examples here. An early Hijazi kufik, uh, a, a later one um, with minimal markings, probably from Iraq around uh, 900. Notice, too, the way the scribe has cut up the text like a piece of pastry, making it almost impossible for you to read it continuously. But with Ibn al-Bawab, there is no ambiguity. <coughs> it's furnished with diacritical marks. Let's go back to it. Here you have it. And it's also fully vocalized. So the decision to write the Quran as legibly as possible could very well be intended in an evangelical spirit, reflecting a desire to reach many more people with the word of God. The presence of non-Arabs in positions of power, first the Persians under the Buyids, then the Turks under the Seljuks, was perhaps another factor making uh, legibility much more desirable. Now this matter of legibility is crucial. Let me explain why. Many forms of Kufic uh, used in Qurans seem to be deliberately illegible. The eye recoils at the way that the words are cut up and rendered almost unrecognizable. Perhaps this follows from a system of teaching calligraphy by making the pupil copy individual letters. In the Maghrib, where pupils were taught to write entire words, this didn't happen. And as a result, the text block, here's something Maghribi, the text block has a continuity, a rhythm, an elasticity that can take both elongation and compression in its stride. But the intense focus on a single letter or a small group of letters, it derails the attention. It slows down the reading process almost to a snail's pace. And this is on the assumption that the individual letters are written according to a recognizable form, a consistent form that's the same from page to page. But they're not. The variations can be extreme. The letters can be written whether they're in initial, medial, or terminal form in all sorts of dramatically different ways. This means, in turn, that the same word can look very different on its multiple appearances. So the reader is put in double jeopardy. All this puts an unexpected gloss on the standard meaning of the word calligraphy, which means beautiful writing and which even in its reduced sense of just handwriting does not connote illegibility, but rather legibility. But here we have illegibility elevated to an art form, some paradox. So was the use of uh, Nas by Ibn al-Bawab, and here are some of the examples of the varieties of script, uh, in, in Kufic, was the use of Nas in this Quran a deliberate experiment? If so, the task which confronted Ibn al-Bawab and his contemporaries was to find some way of averting the danger that the small size of the book would carry unpleasant connotations of something low quality, 
lack of proper respect for the Holy Word. And so the script itself, and here's his challenge, had to be elevated, beautified, solemnized. Not to look like Kufic, but to look also not like a laundry list, not like a shopping list, not like a quick letter you've dashed off to a friend. So our manuscript represents an attempt to invent a version of familiar cursive script that had the weight, the solemnity, the grandeur appropriate to Islam's most sacred text. Ibn Mukla, and here we have uh, a page from the Rampur manuscript in India, which is associated with Ibn Mukla, though many people don't believe it. Ibn Mukla took the decisive step of reforming Persian Kufic, what many scholars now term broken cursive, in a Quran that perhaps bears his signature. So Ibn al-Bawab, looking at something like that, was responding to a major technical challenge. But that too had a dem democratic dimension. For even if Ibn al-Bawab's interest was principally professional, all the attendant advantages that cursive script has over Kufic, and even over broken cursive, come into play when the experiment begins. It's not merely that he has upgraded Nas and promoted it beyond a mere copying script. It's the idea of doing that in the first place, pulling a common script out of a common context and putting it in a sacred context. It's brilliantly simple. Why not use a workaday script? But like other brilliantly simple ideas, such as Columbus deciding to reach China by going west instead of east, it could have been thought of centuries before, but it wasn't. So, what is so special about this particular version of Nasri script? That's a question more easily asked than answered. But when you compare the writing of this manuscript with that of Ibn al-Bawab's near contemporaries. Let's just go back for a second with, for instance, this, which is done within the lifetime of Ibn al-Bawab. Perhaps you can see instantly what the difference is. Perhaps the most striking characteristic is that his hand is more heavy more muscular, more monumental, presumably because of the greater width of most strokes. Since this impression is gained without any loss of buoyancy or rhythm, this script is quite simply more effective as an instrument for holy writing than the hands of other early cursive Qurans. By comparison, they look spindly and lightweight. They don't work. Now, how he does it is another matter. Is it due to the angle at which the kalam is held, the kalam being the reed with which he writes, or even the precise way in which it's been cut? We learn that he never showed anybody how to cut his kalam. He always did it out of sight. But that is the difference, somewhere there, is the difference between a stately script, such as we have here, and a merely elegant one. So let me comment on a few relevant details. First and foremost, the writing is comfortably scaled down. That is to say it's reduced. Remember, the book is this size. And that's an extraordinary achievement. It is not only Nas but nas, as we would say in computer language, of a modest point size. So the technique of using the sheer size of letters to dominate the design of the page 
as is done with so many Mamluk manuscripts in Muhaqqaq or Thulh, was not adopted here. There's a, a typical use of size to make an impact. The simplicity of this brand of Nasr meant an, ex an end to the exaggeration of split up words, of highly exaggerated letter forms, of mashk, the extension of letters, of just a few words per page, sometimes 11 words on a page. Almost at a stroke, Ibn al-Bawab rewrote the design for fine Qurans and replaced the current model with a totally new one. And once again, you have to look at what he came from. Here's the Hadina Quran from uh, Tunis, which was written in the year that he died. Can you imagine a Kufic more difficult to read than this? Here, a much earlier one, probably from the Yemen. And now look at him. His letters are not always the same, as shown by three versions of the terminal meme and four versions of Qaf on the same opening. Sometimes he even varies the letter in the same line. He is not a robot. He is not a typewriter on legs. He is a thinking man. This means that he allows himself multiple options but they do obey rules, rules of harmony, design, proportion. So his justification, that is to say, um, where he ends the line, where he begins it, is approximate, not precise. And letters that should not touch rarely do touch. Think of how you yourself behave when you're in a crowded train or a crowded elevator. We contrive to keep our personal space. And that's what the words do on this page. They keep their personal space. In other words, he makes constant minor adjustments in line by line. He's not afraid of overlap. He saves space by having uh, three dots uh, at the end of an ayah and he writes not absolutely straight and not with a backward sloping hand but with a slight forward lean so that you're encouraged to continue reading and he uses these sublinear flourishes to make your eye continue these bowls which drive your eye further on and make it easier to read But he's also adept at magicking up space for markings as he goes along. The letters are not of even width, but paradoxically, the overall impression is precisely the impression of even writing. Even when your eye tells you this is not even, it looks even. So let me try to summarize Ibn al-Bawab's achievement in this Quran. This is essentially a readable text. The script flows. Uh, the letters are formed more or less as they should be in common script. In spite of close compression, Ibn al-Bawab seems to sense instinctively how to ensure that there is just the right amount of words on the page, even when the text block seems dense and full. Somehow, he manages to create a space, or at least the illusion of a space, which is the same thing. And this is absolutely vital because Arabic has no majuscule, no capital letters, and there's no punctuation. So it's a challenge to make the text readable without punctuation, without paragraphing, without capitals. He seems to have a context 
of the a concept of the whole text block at a glance. A kind of mental grid into which each word slots sweetly and easily, inevitably, so that each vertical and each horizontal is in place. There's nothing mechanical here. There's no pre-echo of the fixed intervals of a computer text or a typewritten text. Now, in order to show how well he does it, you have to look at a contemporary who does it really badly. This is the British Museum Quran of 1036, done 36 years later than Ibn al-Bawab. And it shows the ruinous result when these subtleties vanish. The text in this manuscript seems to have no room to breathe. There are very few extensions of the letters, and those are placed irregularly, seemingly at random. The result is that for the eye, I mean, there is the occasional enlargement, but very little. For the eye, there is no let up. You get more and more tired as you read. There are none of the subtle rests for the eye that make the calligrapher, uh, the calligraphy of Ibn al-Bawab such a pleasure. Moreover, his uh, nasq has a regularity, a compactness, and an overall lack of flourish or exaggeration that allows him to put plenty of words on the, on the line and plenty of lines on the page. So that means that fewer pages are needed to contain the entire text, and there is a great saving in the cost of paper. So the choice of script, which also involved a choice of scale, in this case a modest one, was a choice in favor not only of legibility, but also of cheapness, and therefore of accessibility of the sacred text to more people. This brings me directly to the third section of this lecture, the issue of size. Once again, we people of the 21st century are ill-equipped to assess this topic adequately. We are too used to paperback books, to Penguin 60s and Livre de Poche. We think nothing, as private citizens, of earning hundreds or even thousands of books. For many of us, they are not only cheap, they are disposable. Watch what many students do when they leave university. So it takes an effort of the imagination to conceive of a world in which books as such were rare and precious and big. They were relatively rare because literacy itself was the privilege of the few. They were precious because everything about them was handmade and took a lot of time and often costly materials as well as skilled craftsmanship. And they were big because it seems not to have occurred to people that they could be much, much smaller without losing their usefulness. Take a Quran like this, and it's not even uh, one of the big ones. We're looking at one of the really big ones. We're looking at a Quran for which 800 pregnant cows were killed. And if we have a Quran with many fewer words on the page, then we're talking about thousands of animals being slaughtered. All these factors then, rarity, expense, size, functioned as instruments of exclusion and privilege. Effectively, such books were about status, even if they were not so intended. It's this situation 
that the Quran of Ibn al-Bawab and other slightly earlier Qurans and other texts in broken cursive like it challenged in the most radical fashion. And size is a key element in the equation. Let's look at some of the implications. A picture is worth a thousand words. How would you like to read that book? <laughs> That's a typical early big Quran. It's plain that the size of the volume has a lot to do with its relative cheapness. A page of Ibn al-Bawab's Quran, which is exactly this size, measures 17 and a half by 13 and a half centimeters. And it contains 15 lines. A luxury Umayyad Quran from Sana in the Yemen, written on vellum some three centuries before, has a page three times that size. This, by the way, is a prop. <laughs> Just so that you don't forget what I'm trying to tell you. 51 centimeters by 47 centimeters. And I'm not taking account of all the trimming of the margins on all four sides, which would have made this maybe twice as big. These are books that you cannot lift without damaging yourself. Many early Qurans have only six lines a page. And not to labor the point, a small book used needs, needs less material, whether vellum, papyrus, or paper, than a large book. Less thread for sewing, less leather for binding. Given that the standard display Quran at this time was in many volumes, I've shown you one big one, but most of them are not like that. Each juz has a separate, is a separate volume. There may be 60 of them. When you put them on top of each other, they're taller than I am. The last thing that such Qurans were used for was for reading. They were a symbolic presence in the mosque, like the carpets or the matting with mihrabs or qibla pointing niches woven into them. Not surprisingly, this lesson of economy was learnt not wisely, but rather too well. There are still wonderful display Qurans produced, but it's, this is the way of the future. And these Qurans get smaller and smaller. In the decades after Ibn al-Bawab, uh, the, his 286 folios are reduced to 202, then 175, and then down to 74, in the case of a British Library copy of 1036. In much the same way, later examples are of still smaller scale. You might think, this is small enough, but they get to be half that size, a third that size. Such as the Khalili Quran, 14 by 11, and the smallest of the group is miniature. Dated 1037 in Dublin, it measures nine by seven centimeters. It's precisely these cases that highlight the well, well nigh perfect balance struck in the Quran I've been discussing. For they illustrate how precarious the balance is. You can make it too small. You can make the script too small. You can make the book unpleasant to read. Not just if it's too big, but also if it's too small. The small, handy format opens the way for new uses for the Quran. And none of these have been explored in the literature on this Quran. One could, for example, imagine that Quran serving as a personal gift. 
designed for slipping into your pocket or into your sleeve. It's obviously a perfect spiritual guide for travelers. It was ideally suited for devotional reading at home, in private, and was thus an adjunct and encouragement to private piety and not public piety on a daily basis. Now there was no need to go to a mosque or to any public place to consult the Quran. Moreover, the very act of reading the sacred text is now made easier. It's much more practical to read it in a form that you can carry than in the large and cumbersome format of the multi-volume display Qurans or the uh, elephantine uh, volume that I showed you earlier. This was a Quran into which the reader could dip at leisure, perhaps rather like, to cite an, a European example, a book of hours. Since it was a, a, the, the right size to slip into a pocket or a sleeve, it could also be worn, worn round your neck, touching your own skin, in a way reminiscent of an amulet or a talisman. This too would link to popular expressions of piety. And besides this, there are issues of such books being a spur to literacy in general, as well as a means for democratizing the faith. By removing the word from the control of the religious elite, the only ones who can read it, and putting it into the hands of many, many more people. I almost said putting it into the hands of the man in the street. The very same process that Europe was to undergo in the 15th and early 16th centuries. This kind of Quran fosters independent thought. It offers an alternative route into the Quran from that provided by memory alone. And it makes reference and cross-reference much easier. We should remember too that a big book, unlike this one, is physically intimidating and distancing. It may well require a table, a coffee table book, or a stand which removes the reader still further from the text itself. The new small format allows the reader to take in the text in private at your own speed. It's the reader, male or female, that chooses the time and the place. Rather than having to abide by someone else's convenience or having the text read to them aloud. So there's an element of private, personal meditation that is necessarily missing from a public context. And that privacy extends to the reader's relationship with God. So the book becomes an instrument of devotion in quite a new way. Pondering the spoken word in public and pondering the written word in private, those are two very different activities. And I don't want to overlook the element of luxury implied by the combination of small size and beautiful execution. Look at the, the size of the um, palmettes that mark the beginning of a new surah. Look at the illumination the opening pages, the opening of a great door into religious knowledge, and a similar uh, closing uh, pair of pages. References telling you how many words there are, uh, how many uh, mentions of the sacred names, and so on. A whole series of illuminated pages. Let us recall here the Timurid calligrapher who copied both a tiny Quran, one that could, work, could fit into a walnut, and a huge one for Timur. There's a page of it in the Museum of Islamic Art here. <coughs> and clearly, Ibn al-Bawab was also versatile. He was the painter, he was the illuminator, as well as the scribe. 
So this Quran was both portable and luxurious, a wonderful combination and one with several implications. Portable means private as distinct from public. It fostered just that personal devotion which large format Qurans discouraged. Luxury, yes, but at a price that more could afford. The small size, in other words, did not mean a loss of splendor. And indeed, his Quran is the first in a series of small cursive Qurans. Here's another one with lavish illumination as a major feature of the design. This Quran shows too how important the margin had already become. It is full of action. That page, the Fatiha, shows just how important illumination has become. The marginal ornaments are big, they've not been downsized in proportion to the rest of the volume. Let me try very quickly now to finish and to draw together the threads of this lecture. I've tried to stress just three aspects of the Quran of Ibn al-Bawwab. One, that it is of paper. Two, that it is in Nasri script. And three, that it is small. All these factors seem to converge in a single direction. They imply a desire to make the text of the Quran more easily accessible to ordinary people in ordinary situations. They encourage the reading of the Quran in privacy at home or while traveling, options that had hitherto not existed. To cite a Christian analogy once again, the effect is rather like the translations of the Bible from Latin into the vernacular. Let me end by emphasizing that there's nothing intrinsically difficult about producing this Quran. After all, Paper had long been known, Nasq had long been known, so had very small books. And so had luxury Qurans. But the idea of combining all of these things in one little volume, that was new. And that is why this Quran is such a pivotal work of art. Thank you. Thank you so much for Professor Helen Brandt. Um, I think we can start the question and answer period right now. If sure. Would you like to take the whole like uh, two or three questions together and answer collectively or one no, by one? No, I'll, I'll take them one by one. Okay. Please. Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Quite an interesting topic that really we didn't know much about. Uh, I was wondering if you can share with us the reaction or the reception of the religious elite, the establishment at the time, uh, with regard to uh, you know uh, such a Quran, were they receptive of it, or did they have a problem with you know uh, the issue, just like they had with the print and press, you know, having the sacred text going uh, so common? I mean, uh, I would appreciate if you can share with us some of your thoughts on this. The uh, printed text. Uh, that is, um, that happens about five to six hundred years later. And most of the uh, printed uh, texts in Arabic were done in Europe, far away from the Muslim world. And it's not an accident that when in 1726 the first um, use of printing is done in the Muslim world, it's not even done by Muslims, it's done by Armenians. So clearly, uh, there was a, a very conservative attitude to the issue of printing. We know about that because there is a rich literature on the early printed Arabic texts that come from Venice, Rome, uh, Louvain, and uh, the other European centers. But what I'm talking about happened in the year 1000, and there is zero reaction to it that anyone has found in the literary sources. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that people don't mention Ibn al-Bawab, but they say he was a wonderful calligrapher. And he started the school of whom 
the pupils are Muhammad and then Mustafa and then Ahmad and so on. We know nothing about these people. We know nothing about how they wrote. The way that calligraphy is described in the texts does not allow you to reconstruct what it looked like. We know that Ibn al-Bawab wrote 64 Qurans at least, and he did many other kinds of, of calligraphy. So he was obviously uh, a talented man, a versatile man, uh, who could work on a big scale and a small scale. He worked for Adad al-Dawla in, uh, in Shiraz, decorating his, uh, his palace. So he could work in paint on a, on a wall, as well as uh, with a qalam on a, on a tiny scale. But his impact cannot be judged by any text. What you can tell is that before the year 1000, there is not a single complete small Quran written in Nasr. In the century after him, after he did this, this one in the year 1000, there are dozens. So given that we have lost perhaps 99.9% .9 of the manuscripts that were made, the fact that there is this sudden spike in the survival of Qurans that copy him, but do it badly, but they, they have the basic idea, small paper cursive. That spike tells you that if he wasn't the inventor, he was something close to the inventor, and that it became a massive uh, fashion. And the old big Qurans uh, are now no longer dominating the field. I don't say they weren't made. There's lots of big Mamluk Qurans in multiple volumes. But the day of, of, of the big Quran disappeared around 1000. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robert. If I may just... I'm so sorry. Th thank you so much, Robert. That was brilliant. If I may just add something to the issue of printing, because the first... Pr I, mean, I think the first printed uh, Quran in Arabic was printed in Venice in 1536, was full of mistakes. <laughs> and therefore, it was, it was actually... Um, the whole shipment was burnt, was destroyed. And... and it wouldn't have been acceptable, you know, for a, for a Christian to right. embark on. So that, I, you know, and there were problems with that. Mm, sure. um, but what, what your lecture made me think about, and you mentioned pocketbooks. I mean, you, know, you, know, you surely know the little German series, oh. Reclam. Yes, yes. You know, pro mm. you know, produce the classics <laughs> in teeny little format. Mm. And then I remember the Latin <laughs> translations of... Caesar in in a format of about three or four centimeters that you could just slip in your pocket and you know some naughty naughty students used to take them to the exam you know so but it there is, if, if you then go one step further now and you know we go into the digital age in the sense this allows us to own even more books and to carry them with us all the time, you know. Um, and they're all freely, uh, well, not all freely available, but a lot of them. I mean, I downloaded about 200 catalogues from the Metropolitan Museum recently, you know, and I can have them with me all the time. It would, you know, I would, it would cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds to ship them if you wanted to take them with you everywhere you go. You can't. And so, in fact, this is kind of the extension of you know, which is which made me you know made me think of that really. I mean, we're so opposed to this, but actually, this sort of democratizes the you know availability of, of the written word in many ways. The e -book yeah, the e-book. Yeah. One book that can be read by a thousand people. Yes. You don't have to pay for it. Exactly. So that's why I said this is a Bill Gates moment. Mm. It's uh, it's the the eleventh century equivalent. It's the 11th century equivalent uh, of going online. Obviously, an earlier stage of development. Yes. Well. 
so of course the question is why? Why at this precise juncture in time? Uh, do you have s some thoughts on that? Speculation as to, uh, I mean, yes, there, I there do. are brilliant people, but why at this particular time? Um, this, is, this is the century of the book in Baghdad. And it's the century of the book in Baghdad, specifically, which is where he made it. Uh, suddenly, everybody's interested in books. Suddenly, there are whole streets full of booksellers. And I think, I think that new uh, openness to the book, which coincides, it's a fortunate conjunction with the coming of age of paper and the disappearance of vellum and the disappearance of papyrus. It, it, it's a chicken and egg thing, but there's no question that around the year 1000, there, there, there are far more manuscripts being copied than ever before. And the principal center for it is Baghdad. So he is in the London, the New York of his time. And he is the most famous calligrapher of his time. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful coincidence that we have a complete manuscript signed by him. Uh, at, at this time. So I think, I think it's to do with book culture coming of age. And it's uh, the, the moment for doing something with what had earlier been a scribble and elevating a scribble into fine calligraphy. That, that moment had come. So I think there is a, there's very much an intellectual context and there's a physical context in uh, the final acceptance of paper, the final removal of vellum. Uh, and if you, if you read the, the chronicles for the 10th century in particular, and you look at the stories of, the, of, the, uh, of successive Abbasid viziers, you realize just how huge the uh, element of accountancy was in, 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 in the Abbasid state, and how the degree of surveillance of money that went on in the 10th century is, is staggering. And you needed a, a new material for it, a safe material, uh, safe against hackers, safe against crooks, and paper was that material. So there's, a, there's an administrative element as well as a literary element uh, to the to the sudden um, explosion of of this book culture. Yeah. Um, sorry. Is um, uh, thank you very much. That's a, a wonderful lecture. Um, the is there much known about the author uh, um, if he travelled? at all about much much about about his life uh, the reason I asked that question is that on on, on on your page on your left hand side the 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 fifth uh, the lowest motive in the corner uh, I can understand I can show similar motives on on Chinese Liao silk patterns of the same design whereas uh, on, on an earlier uh, illustration you showed there was a, a border pattern that is so similar to the mausoleum in Bukhara on the, on the decoration around the edge, I, I, I have a feeling that he either saw it or somebody must have dri drawn it for him. Mm. Uh, and I've been spending, apart from listening to your wonderful words, I've been actually looking at all the patterns and making notes of the patterns and mm. seeing where they've come from and where I know them from before. Uh, and I just wondered whether he actually, uh, if we know something about his life and whether he traveled and, and where he traveled to. Well, we know that he travelled to Shiraz. He travelled so, to Shiraz. Uh, he was, but not not to Bukhara. We we don't know that. We don't know that. No, there's not much known about him. <laughs> okay. And 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 the the history about him is a hagiography. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not a biography. It's not reliable. Um, and later generations were were not in the least bit interested whether he went on a vacation to Bukhara and got interested in brick architecture there. <laughs> they were interested in him as the godfather of the best kind of writing. 
And that, that's why his name is used almost as a talisman, uh, a mark of the utmost quality. But he is also, and, and this, this is what makes him quite exceptional, he is also a painter and illuminator. I, I think this is more than illumination, this becomes painting, a lot of this becomes painting. And um, it's, it's known from, from the Tuzkiris that, that, that there were calligraphers who were not just writers but also illuminators. He seems to be one of the first of them. And he is living in Baghdad. He comes from a very lowly station. He's a self-made man. His father was a doorkeeper. Uh, he's a self-made man, but he lives in, well, Hatzfeld said, to underrate Baghdad is to underrate Rome. And Baghdad in the 10th century was the, the center of the world. Uh, perhaps not for the Chinese, but for everybody else. And there he would have seen, uh, he wouldn't have had to go to Bukhara to see beautiful brick buildings. He wouldn't have had to uh, look very far to see people clad in Chinese robes. You'll know better than I uh, the, the quality of the textiles that, that came out of uh, Baghdad in that time. When Ibn Sarapion describes the Byzantine embassy that visited Al Muqtadir in 917, he says that it took them hours and hours, and the, the ambassadors were absolutely exhausted by the time that they got to, the, um, to seeing the caliph himself because they were taken on a roundabout labyrinthine route so that they could see 38,000 fine textiles on display. 38,000 textiles. Well, I don't know whether the, whether the chronicler counted them, but there's, there's a basic idea there of vast, generous, exaggerated display of extremely expensive textiles. And so he lives in that society. He's, um, he is an intimate of the great and the good. So I don't think there's any question that he would have had access, visual access, to, uh, to all that was going in, in, in the capital of the world at that time. Yeah. Professor Ellingham, this was fascinating. I hope I don't I don't really I always know my, my voice carries. Um, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you must be exhausted right now, but I had this, uh, this uh, question to ask you, and that's about the artistic um, point. Does his work uh, follow the um, golden section? Ah. Uh, it's very beautiful. I, I can see that I it's... I absolutely can't answer that. There is an element in which the golden section is like the flying saucer. <laughs> there are those who believe it, and those who believe in the golden section and see it, for example, in the Maidan at Isfahan, um, prove to their own satisfaction that it is used. There are those who disbelieve it and who quarrel pertinaciously with the figures that are generated by the golden section believers. So, I, I have to say, I've never followed that scholarship. Okay. It, 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 it seems to me to be um, full of irreconcilably divergent views. Okay. So I don't want to get into the middle of that. Yeah. So I have to ad ad admit ignorance. Um, that said, I've spent many hours looking at this uh, calligraphy. And a lot of what is said about it about its regularity, for instance, is quite untrue. He is constantly changing pace. He has, uh, he has a sixth sense when he has his alam in his hand of how far to go with any letter or any word. And even when you think, I've caught you now, you've spent too much space on this line 
and you're not going to be able to fit in that last word. He does, damn him. He does fit it in, and he fits it in so elegantly. So that seems to me an argument against a golden section. Um, the very first picture that I showed you Oh, come on. This picture is an attempt by Ahmad Mustafa in London, a wonderful calligrapher in his, in his own way, to tell us how Ibn Mukhla created the proportion script. It's total fantasy. And it's very easy to prove that it's total fantasy because the idea, for instance, that eight diamond strokes of a qalam make an alif can be proved wrong on any page of, of, uh, of Ibn al-Bawab's Quran. Sometimes his, his alif is is nine, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's seven. He doesn't, he doesn't follow it. Man is not a machine. I, 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 can, I can bring myself to believe that the golden section works in architecture. But in architecture, you make a plan and you carry it out. And you measure properly and you trust that you get it right. But when you're writing a text, you're a living being and you're subject to the contingencies of fatigue, eyesight, a trembling hand, I've had enough for today. You think about something different and your concentration slips. Now, I'm not trying to say that, that uh, Ibn al-Bawab's Quran is full of that because it isn't. He's a wonderful calligrapher and I think he kept himself in a state of intense concentration and for all I know, pious concentration while he was copying. He did make mistakes. There's a mistake in, in, towards the end of the Quran where he left out an entire phrase and he puts it in later. But fundamentally, I think this tells a big lie, a big, big lie. But one of the reasons why it's constantly reproduced is that it's such a nice drawing. <laughs> and you'd like to believe it, and you think, yeah, I'll illustrate that. Yeah. But it's not true. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Mm. Let's have one more question. Mr. Karuba, please, microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. I have one question, and uh, this is, do you think someone could have specifically ordered such a Quran? So could you think there is someone behind who had that idea, I want to make the Quran more accessible, I want to change the size, I want to, you know, get it out? <laughs> That's a very nice idea. It's <laughs> a very nice idea. Uh, and there's something in favor of that, um, not in the uh, script, but in the decoration. The decoration is extremely expensive. It uses extremely expensive materials. Where did he get it from? We know from, from the, the way that medieval workshops were organized that the people in charge of the workshops regarded all painters and illuminators as crooks. They were all looking to get expensive materials which they could sell off on the side. So uh, if, you, if you say you need two ounces of ground lap lapis lazuli, give me a good reason. So when you, when you see the amount of expensive uh, minerals that are used in, in, in this manuscript, and when you look at a full colophon, which does not mention a patron, you're puzzled. Did he write it for himself? Was this his own personal luxury? Uh, I, I have no idea. 
was it for the market? There's one other important Islamic manuscript of the same kind of uh, significance as his Quran, which is the Shefa Hariri of 1237. Now that's the finest of all the Makamat illustrated manuscripts, it has 99 illustrations. It must have taken a great, great artist many, many months to prepare. It too has a very full colophon and it mentions no patron. So did these two works of art get created for sale in the market to an unnamed patron? Or were they done by the artist for himself? There's no evidence either way. You can't, you can't answer that question. But I think somebody did make the triangulated decision to bring these three things together, the size, the paper, the script. And, and this, this was the result. But, but if you think that 99.9% .9 of everything that was produced in the medieval Islamic world has gone, then it's, it's, it's a long chance that the one thing that survives was actually the very first. I, I really can't tell. It's, it's an interesting idea, though, that, it, that, it did, that this is a, an invention that didn't just happen, but was very deliberate. A deliberate striking out in a new direction. Yeah, I can believe that. Any more questions, I think? Please. Um, uh, I, 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 Forgive me, I, I, I know nothing about Islamic calligraphy. I'm learning here for the first time. Uh, is there any indication, uh, have, have any of these things been x-rayed uh, in as much as, is there any indication of any underdrawing of any sort, or is it just written straight off the top? There's no, uh, there's no sort of pencil or pre-preparation, pre pre-thought to the page and pre-thought to how it was going to be a uh, thing, or is it just like a Japanese uh, uh, calligraphy that's written straight with a, as, as enough inks on the brush, and you finish the brush stroke and that's the end of it? Well, I remember watching a calligrapher in the Isfahan Bazaar draw a straight line. And it was a straight line on a sheet of paper that big. And watching him was as interesting as watching paint dry or watching the washing machine go round and round and round and round. But the end result was perfection. And I, I think that answers your question about the Far Eastern calligrapher who concentrates his mind and holds his brush and then with lightning strokes does his business and sits back. And the Islamic calligrapher is the exact opposite with everything done at the slowest possible uh, pace but with total control. I, I watched a miniature painter again in Iran. Uh, paint, he gave me, gave me this as a present because he was pleased that I entered his shop and recognized that he was copying named painters and I named the painters that he was copying. He obviously hadn't had a customer who, who knew that he was copying some of the great works of Persian painting. So he made me a present of something that I saw him make from the beginning to the end. It was a picture of a Sufi sheikh under, underneath a tree. And do you know how he did it? He began with the toe of the boot of the Sufi sheikh. He began at the bottom and created the whole damn thing in about 10 minutes without taking his pen away from, from the paper. Now, I think that that kind of manual skill, that kind of technical assurance means not that Ibn al-Bawab never made a practice drawing, but I think having decided what shape he wanted for that roundel or that, that polygon, 
I think he did it unerringly by eye. Straight from his head. Straight from his head. I, th I think the, the quality of the, the ability there is something right out of the right out of what anyone today can do. Um, thanks to everybody. I have uh, five very small points actually. First of all, uh, we are honored as Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies. We are honored to have you uh, today, Professor Hillenbrand. And we look forward to welcoming you again in the future. And special thanks, uh, secondly, special thanks to my colleagues at the Museum of Islamic Arts who made this uh, possible through our collaboration. And thirdly, special guests, actually our colleagues, students, uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, joining our event. Number four, our events are continuing. Uh, the closest one on January 28th, uh, a workshop that we are organizing is public policy in Islam program uh, on uh, botanic preservation in Islam. If you are interested in to learn uh, natural sustainability, nature resource management from Islamic perspective, uh, please uh, join. And uh, you can also visit our website qfis.edu.qa to be informed about our forthcoming events. Many more are coming on the way. And number five, um, we have some ref refreshments and beverages outside. Uh, please join and maybe uh, our discussion could go uh, maybe on an informal basis. And we look forward to seeing you again in the near future, inshallah. Ma'as-salam. Ma